Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and tonight we want to talk about the causes of the English Civil War. Now there are two reasons for this. The first one is the fact that after our successful uh, videos that we put on about the Battle of Worcester in the run-up and, and, and actually covering the battle on the 3rd of September, uh, we kept getting asked by people uh, can you tell us in a little bit more detail of why the wars were taking place? So tonight we're hopefully tick that box. So for those that have asked for that as a video, tonight we're going to cover some of the basics of why the war started in the first place. The second reason is this week on the 23rd of September, we do actually have the anniversary of the start of the English Civil War. Now, I'd say start of the Civil War. Some people say, well, that started on the 22nd of August when the, uh, the, the King, Charles I, raised the standard in Nottingham. Interesting fact, when it was raised uh, that evening in a storm, it fell down. And a lot of people actually said the next thing to fall would be the King's head himself. But the interesting thing is, some people say that's the start of the war in the August of 1642. However, I like to think really the official start is when they fight for the first time and most people will say that is definitely at Poet Bridge and obviously like I said on the 23rd so this Wednesday is the commemorations of that and we will be putting videos on like we did with the Battle of Worcester uh, talking about the phases of the fight so please stay tuned and if you're not please subscribe as well so that's the reasons for this video to answer the question for those that want it and also uh, a, a great starting point it looking at the battle of poet bridge now we usually do a video that lasts about 10 15 minutes and we have done a few that's a little bit longer but generally we try and keep it to 15 minutes so what we're going to do is hopefully a whistle stop tour of why those wars took place and i say wars because most people will call it a war, English Civil War from 1642 to 1651, but really it's a series of conflicts, which is why we should really call it the English Civil Wars, starting in 1642 and finally ending in 1651. So we can really break it down into three causes and a lot of subheadings under that. One has to be religion, two has to be uh, wars generally, uh, that was going on before the Civil War broke out and also the instability of the country in the 1640s. So if we start with religion, uh, religion is a very complex subject, especially in the 1640s, but there are several little subheadings that we will cover. The first one is the fact that Charles I, like most monarchs really, believed that he was appointed by God. In other words, he had what was called the divine right of kings. Now that had always caused a problem. If you think back to uh, King John, for example, he had to put his seal to Magna Carta because he was throwing his weight around, killing people, imprisoning people, uh, taking over land, for example. And the interesting thing is Magna Carta was created to stop him from doing that, to actually remind the king that he was not above the law. Well, Henry VIII was pretty much the same, uh, especially when you look at the dissolution of the monasteries and the break with the Catholic Church. And it's interesting that the monarchs have always assumed really that they were appointed by God so technically they could do what they wanted but the interesting thing is by the 1640s with Charles doing pretty much what he wanted opening and closing parliament and so on and um, it was decided that some people wanted to rein in his power and was the divine right of kings a real thing so there was a lot of questions being asked and that upset a lot of people. Some people sided with the king and said pretty much he was appointed by God, so should be obeyed. And then other people that sided with Parliament reckoned that he should have his powers reined in, a bit like King John and Magna Carta. The other interesting thing is King Charles was married to the French Catholic, which was Queen Henrietta Marie. And even though today that wouldn't sound so bad, what you have to remember is back in the 1640s, as it had been since the age of Henry VIII, every monarch has not only taken the role on as being monarch to this country, they've also taken on the role of being the head of the Church of England. Now, that's fine to a certain degree because it's the king that's in charge of the country. But this marriage to a French Catholic was annoying to a lot of people. And there's two reasons. One, 
uh, the Catholic religion had always been seen as a superstitious one and a very secretive one, especially if you start thinking about Latin text, all the incense and the bow ringing, for example. So they were never, ever trusted. And you think um, there was a lot of rebellions, for example. You've only got to think back to 1605 and the gunpowder plot, and that's only one plot. And then turn back the clock to 1588 in the Spanish Armada, and they wanted to return this country to the old religion, the Catholic Catholic religion so they were always looked upon as uh, not a group of people to be trusted so when Charles marries a Catholic and a French one at that uh, it upset a lot of people how can he be in charge of the head of the Church of England but like I said there was two reasons why uh, Queen Henrietta Marie was hated the second one being the fact that she was French and a lot of people especially if you go right back in history uh, have had a dislike for the French especially with the fact that they have always been generally our old enemy so the religious aspect plays an important part in the start of the civil war when you look at Prince Charles and we're talking about Charles who would later fight at the Battle of Worcester and become King Charles II in 1660 he was actually brought up partly as a Catholic there were several times where he attended mass with Queen Henrietta Marie so you can imagine when this news got out to your average person it would have upset them greatly but then you've also got Archbishop Lord. Archbishop Lord introduced a series of measures in the Church of England, which a lot of people said was a bit papist, in other words, a bit Catholic. And this included things like altar rails, for example, and that upset a huge portion of the nation uh, to the point where there were little outbreaks of rebellions in Britain. But it's not just in England that we're talking about. We always mention the English civil wars, but it was a nationwide event. And Charles also, and he's a Scottish king at the end of the day, Charles Stuart, King of England. Um, he was a Scotsman at the end of the day. Uh, he introduced a prayer book in Scotland, which also caused an offence to the Scottish church. And that actually led to uh, quite a big rebellion in Scotland. Uh, and it also led to what became known as the Bishop's War. So there's a lot of problems in the 1640s and it's upsetting a lot of people but religion the reason why i mentioned religion first is because that had a massive impact on what would be the english civil wars there was also a vast amount of instability in the land and that's down to the fact that charles had a series of advisors that gave him very very bad advice and then there was all the different conflicts that were going on that Charles was sort of embroiled in and that includes the uh, the, 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 the problems with Scotland, uh, the uh, question mark on the Irish rebellion and in, in, in how that would impact on England and also the foreign wars and you have to remember Charles had links with foreign monarchies as well so he almost had this duty to assist them so there was religious wars going on abroad and obviously Charles wanted to assist uh, family members or distant family members with those wars the often referred to as the final straw as such really was also the attempt at the arrest of the five members in parliament and that had, that was usually referred to as the final straw of the entire uh, causes of the English civil war but as well as having religious problems and this instability that was growing in the 1640s there was also this taxation thing and this was really as a result from war so this is linked quite closely with instability and warfare and the taxation was massive uh, Charles needed money uh, to assist family members and to assist in foreign wars and the problem was he had to go to parliament for it often parliament would say no so Charles very simply closed it down. There was a period that was often referred to as the 11 years of tyranny where the parliament was, was closed full stop and Charles did pretty much what he wanted. But that really stems back to the fact that he was appointed by God. He had the divine right, basically. Um, but to go along with that, um, taxation was a major problem. He would uh, invent taxes and that was literally to help pay uh, for these uh, foreign things that was going on at the time. Uh, and he would also resurrect the old taxation as well, the old taxes that were long gone that he would find in the statute books or get his advisors to find and then resurrect them to claim money that way. Um, ship tax had a major problem and that was especially true for Worcester. The ship tax was a tax that was basically levied on 
all coastal towns originally and it was helped to pay for the navy but by 1642 that was being rolled out across the whole of britain including places like worcester so you can imagine it upset a lot of people so by the start of the 1640s and especially in the summer of 1642 there was already two camps that were starting to appear you had those that were the traditionalists that were people that followed the monarchy. They believed that they should follow the monarchy because after all, uh, God appointed the king. And therefore, if you look back through family members, we've always supported the monarchy. So you had these traditionalists is the best way of putting it, really. Uh, and they wanted to, uh, to, to, to boost up the king. They wanted to follow the king no matter what. But then there was also this new uh, group of people, the, what, what, what slowly became known as the parliamentarians that wanted to rein in uh, the king's power and like I just commented with all the other causes they were the ones that really wanted to see change um, the two groups were generally called uh, the royalists those that were following Charles uh, or the monarchy and then you had these parliamentarians that followed the parliament view on things and um, we often hear the terms cavalier and roundhead and in a way we should stop using those words uh, at the time in the 17th century they were used but they were only used as terms of abuse the term cavalier actually comes from cavalero really which is spanish catholic cavalry that often carried out vast amounts of war crimes so when you call a cavalier a cavalier you're not referring to him as riding a horse that would be cavalry you're actually referring to him as being this very bad uh catholic that went around carrying out war crimes and obviously if you wasn't a catholic and not all catholics were in the royalist army if you were uh, not a catholic you would be pretty upset with being called a cavalier the term roundhead usually referred to the fact that you're saying that that person is not educated enough not rich enough uh, to uh, go through life drinking wine and in in, in partying uh, he's the sort of person that has to get a trade a job he has to cut his hair short to take part as an apprentice really um for for a job to get employment so once again to uh, a member of the nobility that was siding with parliament that would be upsetting for them as well so as i said the words cavalier and rounded they're actually terms of abuse not to do you not they shouldn't be used really to describe the two sides we should be using royalist and parliamentarian in charge of the royalists obviously by the 1640s it was king charles the first and he was going to gather together his people uh, to help push his cause and in parliament oliver cromwell wasn't around oliver cromwell was just a member of parliament at the time we have the earl of essex and he is the man that wants to push for this change and to uh, to, to rein in the king's powers but famously on august the 22nd 1642 that standard was raised in nottingham and that in a way is the official start of the war and apart from the odd shot being fired in the general direction of the royalists and the parliamentarians there had been no major engagement however looming this Wednesday, on the 23rd of September 1642, we have the first true clash of arms, the sparks that ignite an entire war. It's a clash that is very rarely mentioned, and the main reason for not mentioning is it was such a small clash of arms. It lasts only about 15 minutes in total. The second reason is the fact that most people talk about the major battle with the infantry, the cannon and the cavalry, which is really not until later on when we have the Battle of Edge Hill. But obviously, as we said at the start of this video, this week we will be publishing videos, just like we did with the Battle of Worcester, concentrating on looking at the Battle of Poet, because at the end of the day, famously, Worcester is where the Civil War began, and famously, as the quote says, and where it is happily ended on the 3rd of September 1651. Anyway, on that note, stay safe, make sure you subscribe and tune in, especially on the 23rd, to watch our coverage of the Battle of Poet Bridge. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.